what makes someone great. We have this um, this idea of um, do you know do you know who the goat is? Someone knew what the goat was. Who said that? That's right. The goat is the G-O-A-T, the greatest of all time. And we have this concept of greatness in lots of fields, I mean, particularly sporting fields. So, I mean, should we do some? Um, who is the greatest boxer of all time? Muhammad Ali. I think there's not a great deal of controversy about this one. Very good. What about the greatest tennis player of all time? I know we're in Switzerland, but come on. <laughs> Did someone say Serena Williams? Interesting. Could be Roger Federer. Could be Djokovic, maybe. Mm. Who is the greatest basketball player of all time? No idea. (laughs) Michael Jordan, perhaps? LeBron James, the new contender? Who's the greatest golfer of all time? Sevi Ballesteros, that's a great answer. That's better than Tiger Woods. Who's the greatest footballer of all time? (laughs) Kaz, I'm sorry, but no. (laughs) Did someone say Pele? I think Pele's a really good answer. There are two modern contenders, Messi and Ronaldo, both of whom are amazing. All right, different field. Who's the greatest military leader of all time? Nelson, Sun Tzu, one closer to home, Napoleon maybe. It's interesting, isn't it? We have this concept of greatness and it's based on what? Success, victory, superiority, crushing your opponents. And it's fine, but I do not think that that is what real greatness is. And this is another one of those teachings of Jesus, which is incredibly radical and has, in fact, changed the world that we live in. Because Jesus' understanding of what greatness looks like turns that on its head. So we're going to explore that a little bit this evening. And um, we are returning to Mark's gospel. Gospel of St. Mark, where we left off back in just in November, I think, just before the start of Advent. And the reason we're coming back now is because we're going to follow this journey through looking to Easter, to Holy Week, to the Passion, and to the Cross. And we will allow this to unfold over these weeks. And this is the story of two of Jesus' disciples, two actually rather ambitious young men. And the lesson that they learned. Did you see that they're called James and John? Their father is Zebedee. And there is some suggestion that Zebedee is, I don't know, a kind of fairly important man in their community. So he may have just had been a little bit more wealthy. He may have been someone who employed other fishermen to work for him. He's kind of a big deal in a small community. And so they are the sons of a relatively important man. And so for them, coming to follow Jesus and leaving that behind meant, you know, making some significant sacrifices. They'd left a lot, they'd given up a lot to follow Jesus. And they just kind of, they're just trying to make sure that the payoff is worth it. You know, they're sort of trying to make sure that, well, they've given up some status, but they're expecting better status in Jesus' kingdom. And so they make an outrageous request. It is this, verse 35. Oh, did uh, people manage to find this, by the way? If you want to follow this in the Bible, it's um, uh, Mark chapter 10. Can someone shout out a page number if you want that? What is, what's that, Kaz? It's page 60 in the New Testament. Maybe not all of the Bibles are numbered that way. Anyway, it's Mark 10. You can find your way there. So they make this outrageous request, and they say to Jesus, verse 35, we would like you to do whatever we want. Now, isn't that just a brilliant and slightly embarrassing thing to say to Jesus? Can you imagine? Hello, Jesus. We would like you to do whatever we want. I mean, honestly, you wince at this. 
But as I reflected on that a little bit, I thought, you know what? I feel like we all do that quite a lot of the time to Jesus. We're like, you know, listen, Jesus, we've given up a lot to follow you. Uh, There's just this one thing that I want, and I don't understand why you won't give it to me. You know, this job or this relationship or this house or whatever it is. It's only a little thing for you. There's something in all of us that says to Jesus, we want you to do what we want. And their version of that, their request is frankly breathtaking. So in verse 37, they say, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left when you come into your glory, when you come into your kingdom. So Jesus is the king in this new kingdom and they want to be his right hand man. They want to be next in line. They want power and status and to be famous and to be great. Isn't that a a brilliant request? Oh, my goodness. And um, our world loves those things. Our world loves status and success. And we have such a strong view of hierarchy, and we want to know what our position is in that hierarchy. And that's true in the world. The sad truth is it's also very often true in the church that um, we tend to almost kind of echo those same values of the world. And so church can kind of have these hierarchies and people could be striving for status and power or celebrity and fame. There's this real temptation for Christian leaders to pursue status or celebrity or fame and to say that they've got good motives for it you know this is going to be a way to spread the gospel more widely but it's a dangerous game to play greatness is not achieved by success or status and there's a hard lesson for these disciples to learn here i can almost imagine jesus looking at them when they've made this outrageous request and sort of you know that thing where you say suck your teeth like Because do you see what he says to them in verse 38? You do not know what you are asking. You do not know what you are asking for. You want greatness? Okay. Sure. But in my kingdom, greatness is earned a different way. And then he says it in the second half of verse 38 in a way that's a little bit cryptic. He says, um, can you drink the cup of suffering that I must drink? Can you be baptized in the way that I must be baptized? And uh, can you see what he's referring to? So the two pictures, the cup comes up regularly. It's partic- I was particularly thinking of Gethsemane, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus says, Father, take this cup from me. And so the cup is a sort of reference to, to suffering, to giving of yourself, um, to sacrifice on behalf of others. And then baptism, baptism isn't about being baptized in water. It's the thing to which water baptism points to. When people are baptized, we talk about entering into the death of Christ and then coming up into his resurrection, his new life. And so that's what Jesus is talking about. The first lesson of this, there is greatness to be found in God's kingdom. But it is a greatness that is earned through sacrifice, selflessness, service, and suffering. There is a glory to be found in God's kingdom. But the greatest expression of that, well, because Jesus talks about going to his glory. And when he's talking about that, he's referring to the cross. The greatest expression of the glory of God isn't the wonders of creation, isn't the majesty of his love. It is the cross of Christ. That sacrifice of an innocent on behalf of others that they might be forgiven and find new life and be reconciled to God. And Jesus says to them, can you share in that? Do you understand what you're asking for? Now, these two boys probably realize that they've got themselves in quite deep at this point and um, not quite so sure of themselves now. But to their credit, do you see at the verse 39? We can, they answered. And Jesus kind of recognizes that in actual fact, despite their sort of bravado and their youthful enthusiasm at this point, they will actually share in these things. And the truth is that, um, so this is verse 39, you will share in the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. And the truth is that 
all of the apostles would follow in Jesus' footsteps. They would give themselves entirely and would serve and sacrifice themselves for the sake of others. And in fact, all but one would die a martyr's death for the gospel. And um, they would achieve real greatness in the kingdom of heaven. You know, these two boys, their names have gone down in history. They have transcended any of those great people we talked about at the start of the sermon. They'll be forgotten in the space of a generation. These two, their greatness endures to eternity. In fact, can you imagine one day we will actually get to meet them? And we'll be like, oh, you're the one. You were there. Oh, my goodness. Or to meet Peter. There is a greatness that is found which endures into eternity, but it is not found the way that our world seeks greatness. And so I suppose there is an encouragement there, isn't there? I don't really think that we would think to do this, but there is a greatness that you can seek. And amongst us this evening, there are some who are greats in the kingdom of God some of whose greatness will endure into eternity. And that is a greatness that is earned through service and love and sacrifice and selflessness and giving themselves to others. And if you were to look around, you probably wouldn't spot them because they don't look that much in the eyes of the world. And yet in the eyes of God, there is true greatness to be found. So seek that. There's um, a lovely George Bernard Shaw quote, actually, along these lines. It says this. This is the true joy in life, he says. Being used for a mighty purpose. Instead of complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy, I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community. And as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it what I can. That picture of giving of ourselves for the sake of others. Greatness lies that way. Now, one word of warning in this, because this sometimes gets misunderstood and abused. So what this is not is submissiveness. is not never complaining or doing all the work while others sit around. This idea has often been used to to oppress people, to uh, keep people in their place. Serving people does not mean you let people walk all over you. Be selfless, yes. Be generous, yes. But to serve people in the way of Jesus may often also mean challenging them too. But note the central idea of this, that the greatest of all, Jesus himself, humbles himself and serves others. And he sets the model. The thing that he's asking us to do, he does first. And so what this all leads to is one of the great expressions of the gospel at the heart of the Christian faith. Let me just read those words again from verse 41. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. No surprise there. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who were regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great amongst you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And there is the gospel. God himself gives himself for the sake of others. And if God has done that, then we follow in his footsteps. We give of ourselves to one another. And that's the radical idea that Jesus teaches. That's the upside down world where the greatest amongst us is the servant of others. That the one who is first appears least. It's an astonishing idea, but it's what makes the church, when it is the church, exceptional. Because it is full of people, not seeking themselves or their own good or their own glory, 
but seeking the good of others. This should mark who we are. I feel like this verse should be written above the door of the church, or at the very, li- very least written upon our hearts. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And so, one last question. And I suspect you know the answer to this question. Who is the goat? Who is the greatest of all time? Well, I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to leave it to one of those people that we mentioned at the beginning. I'm going to leave it to, and these are remarkable words, Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon said this. Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Charlemagne, Charlemagne and myself founded empires. But on what did we build the creations of our genius but upon sheer force? Jesus Christ himself founded his empire upon love. And to this day, millions would give themselves for him. An amazing statement. Who is the greatest of all time? There is only one who built his empire. Not that I'm entirely comfortable with that word. But he built it upon love. And to this day, across the world, millions upon millions would declare their loyalty to him. Jesus is the greatest of all time. Follow him and find a greatness that endures and endures into eternity. Amen.